Hey family, this is Jay Jones, host of Black Entrepreneur Blueprint, the podcast. And I want to welcome you to the video edition of episode number 273, where I interview dynamic young entrepreneur, Miss Amber Quinney, also known as the Scholarship Queen. Now, the seeds of Amber's business actually started when she was in college, unbeknownst to her. So during Amber's college career, she found that she was running out of money and the only way that she could finish her education was by getting more scholarships. So in the process, Amber got over six figures in scholarships and completed her education. Now let's fast forward to right after graduation. Amber decided to start her own business and bet on herself. And she told me in the interview that she listened to my episode 199, Pinpoint and Monetize Your Genius. And your genius is the intersection of your passion and your talent. And she used the mind map from that episode 199 to actually create her business. And now she has a very successful business and she's known all around the world as the scholarship queen who helps people get scholarships to complete their education. So if you're interested in the Pinpoint and Monetize Your Genius online implementation program, you can go to bebgenius.com, bebgenius.com and enroll and you can save $100 off the enrollment by using the coupon code GENIUS, G-E-N-I-U-S. So if you're interested in pinpointing and monetizing your genius, which is the intersection of your passion and your talent, and building a customized business for you, go to bebgenius.com and use the code GENIUS to save $100. So now we're getting ready to listen to dynamic young entrepreneur, Miss Amber Quinney, and how she built her business and why she's known as the Scholarship Queen. So stay tuned for Amber. We are on the line and also on video with Miss Amber Quinney. She is the Scholarship Queen. Now, Amber, for those of us that don't know who you are, can you give us a little bit of background? Um, then we're going to jump into your entrepreneurial journey. Yes. Yes. Jay, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to be on this side of the podcast. I'm a <laughs> member of the BEB family, a loyal listener. And so I'm grateful to be on this end. So, hey, how you doing, family? I'm Amber Quinney, professionally known as the Scholarship Queen. I am a child of God, first and foremost. I am a servant. I'm a scholar. I am a 24-year-old business owner. I'm a competitive scholarship coach. I'm a good girl's advocate, and best of all, I'm a speaker. I absolutely love speaking. I've been speaking almost my entire life in different capacities, but I officially kickstarted my public speaking career. Uh, my last year of college, I got to do a TED Talk. It's something I'm super proud of. My talk has gone viral. It's reached people in countries I've never been to, countries I've never heard of, <laughs> but um, people have made it their business to find me on social media and let me know how that 18 minutes bless their life. And so I'm so grateful. I know that being a speaker is my profession, but I, I really believe that being a messenger and a truth teller is my spiritual gift and it is my divine assignment on this planet. So to answer your question, I <laughs> am, <laughs> I'm a young woman who is gifted and wildly talented, eager about life, resilient, and I give myself permission to live in my genius every single day. There you go. I appreciate that. So now, Amber, I, I know I know some of the backstory because you and I are good friends with my man Elijah Tyson, so yeah. who was actually on the show before. But um, how did you get started? Tell us what your your scholarship, your legendary scholarsacademy.com is, and tell people how that that kind of started. Yes. So to begin, my so I'll say this: scholarships plus crazy faith is how I survived college. Cool. Right. And so um, Pastor Michael Todd out in Tulsa at uh, Transformation Church, he talks about this idea of crazy faith. Um, and it, it's, 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 it's helped me learn how to tell my story because it's how I survive scholarships. Right. And so my community of peers and professors and mentors, they nicknamed me the scholarship queen. <laughs> like just going through all college, he would say, wow, every time I look around, these girls earning scholarships. I never stopped applying. I started in 10th grade and I, I never stopped applying. In fact, I'm a college graduate and I just earned my first scholarship post-grad this summer. That's so 
uh, the Black MBA Association DC chapter created this new scholarship called Debt Relief Scholarship. And the scholarship queen was the first to earn it. But I say that to say it was my nickname. Like, okay. and, <laughs> and casually, I've been coaching people. They'd say, could you coach my kid? Could you help me? I'm trying to go back to school. Every time you look around, you're earning scholarships. And mm. so I'll give you the short but very detailed story. Okay. When I started college at Howard University, I didn't come in on a scholarship. Right. And in, in retrospect, I, that sh I, I should have questioned that and we should have kind of fought against that because I was the three nine student. I was the class president. I was the ideal student who should have had a full ride. But I didn't. And I made up my mind that I deserve a, a world class, high quality education and nothing will stop me, not even money. And so I applied to every single scholarship that I could find because I wanted to go to Howard and that's right. where I deserve to go. And so. At um, the start of my junior year, I decided to transfer from Howard to Canisius College, which is a um, small Jesuit college here in Western New York in my hometown. And what happened was my sophomore year of college, I was 19 years old and I was having this early life crisis okay. where this teenage life crisis, because you got to keep in mind, I'm a student student. Like I've been excelling my whole life academically. I have never been denied education access to education and so my sophomore year at Howard um, I remember after winter break coming back to school on the plane register for no classes crazy faith mm -hmm. and so I didn't know how I was going to make it that semester but I knew I had to go back to school and so um, I ended up going to class for three months unregistered Wow. That's how bad I wanted to be in class. Like I would go to class and then the meanwhile I would go and I would chase around administrators and student accounts and financial <laughs> aid and I was writing letters and knocking on doors. I mean, I was fighting because that's how bad I wanted to see in the classroom. That's how bad I wanted to graduate. And so I remember um, my mom saying like, I, you're not doing this anymore. I'm coming to get you. Like you are not because Jay, I have been put out my dorm because now technically I'm not a student. Student, right. You go on a class every day for, for three months and you're not registered on paper. You're not a student here. Room and board is gone. Meal plan is gone. Like I'm out here like living right. crazy. Yeah. And so um, I just remember uh, this long winded uh, story to say, my mom was coming to get me on a Friday. On a Wednesday, I got a call from a man in the alumni office and he said, Amber, I have two people in front of me who want to write you a check to go to school. Whoa. And I'm like, wow crazy and so crazy faith right That's and right. so um i rushed there to the office and i'm coaching myself i'm not gonna cry i'm not gonna <laughs> cry i get to the office the tears come rolling down <laughs> there's two people standing in front of me a man and a woman the woman is crying i don't know why she's crying the man is so excited and beaming with excitement turns out it was a husband and wife two howard alum who had came to the office to talk um to alumni the alumni office about establishing a scholarship foundation mm -hmm. it just so happened that the wife's it was a husband and wife. Her story was my story when she was wow. at Howard. Get out. She went to Howard for four years being unregistered. And so I say that to say I became the scholarship queen by fighting to um, finish, right? To right. graduate. I earned an abundance of six figures in scholarships. At one point, I earned more scholarships than I needed. My refund checks were fat and they weren't right. They were loans, <laughs> right? They weren't loans. And, right. um, and so I, I say that to say, again, it became a nickname at first, um, because that's who I was. And so after college, um, I was burned out. <laughs> I graduated right. last year and I always knew I wanted to be a business owner. I never knew that I could monetize it. I never knew that I could trademark my nickname. Mm -hmm. And so um, I love when people ask me, not just how'd you become the scholarship queen, because they already knew that's who I was, but right. how'd you go about starting a business? And I love to tell them, well, I figured out how to pinpoint and monetize my genius. <laughs> and then they say, what, tell me more. And, and, and I love when I get to say, you know what? There's a brother who could tell you better. Let me tell you about my teacher, Jay. <laughs> Literally, Jay, that's how I established the business. My business name is the Scholarship Queen. Queen. Um, I'm working on obtaining a trademark with the, a lawyer. And literally, I remember sitting in my friends, like I was with Elijah, and um, we had listened to the episode. We literally charted it out. And so mm -hmm. I listed out my passions, and I listed out my talents, and then there's your platform, and then there's the six things you can sell. And so mm -hmm. when I looked at, wow, I'm passionate about education and self-enrichment, storytelling, and Black excellence, like all these just passions all over the place. 
I am business savvy. Um, I'm competitive, right? I did competitive cheer, um, dance. I'm a pageant queen, competitive debate wise. I competed in case studies with Fortune 500 companies. Like I'm a beast when it comes to competing. I see that. I see that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm a marketer. And then it dawns on me like, you know, I'm great at speaking and being a role model. I'm really good at winning scholarships. And so mm -hmm. I, it, just this niche, it dawns on me because it seems like the first two quadrants of the mind mapping tool, right. it's really about pinpointing and the bottom right. two are more about monetizing. But I, it, it was like, ah, <laughs> like, right. genius. And so it's such a very niche space. Um, I don't work in college admissions. I don't do SAT, AC, do I do scholarship coaching. I coach students on how to be the most competitive scholarship candidate in the game, period. Mm -hmm. And so the, the riches are in the niches, like that's they say. Right. That's right. <laughs> but it's genius. That's, right. that's literally how I arrived at this business. Oh, well, I, I, I appreciate you telling that story because when people ask me, give them some of the best podcasts, you know, of my podcast, Black Entrepreneur Blueprint, I always take them to number 199 and that was titled pinpoint and monetize your genius. And that's where you got, you know, the mind map and everything from. So, yeah. so 199 pinpoint and monetize your genius and your genius is the intersection between your passion and your talent. And so when I, I started thinking about that episode, I, I started looking at or thinking about what would make people more successful as an entrepreneur and also give them uh, joy in doing so. I started thinking about what you're passionate about because I actually had to do this when I reinvented myself after my mortgage business crash. So mm -hmm. that's really where the impetus came from. Uh, I had to come back and I, I wanted to do something that I enjoyed and I wanted to use my talents, things that I'm good at to put those two together because when you do that, that's just going to make your, the possibility of your business, the success of your business, just multiply because you're doing something that you enjoy and something that you're good at and you're putting them together. So 199, I'm glad you listened to that episode, Amber. But I, <laughs> I'm know. in business full time for myself and I'm fresh out of college because of a mind mapping exercise that I listened to on a podcast. It's real, people. That's what's up. It I works. appreciate that. I appreciate that. Uh, so now with that in mind, so how did you start off um, once you got to pinpoint monetize, you went through the mind mapping exercise and everything? What, what was your first step or what did you start thinking about um, in terms of the monetization aspect? Yes. So, Jay, you know how you always say on the podcast about trialing, erroring, testing, don't be pressed to monetize. Well, I'm That's a great it. case that proves why you shouldn't <laughs> be pressed to monetize. <laughs> okay. I was very pressed to monetize. So I graduated college last year. I graduated on Malcolm X's birthday, oh, um, May 19th. Awesome. Yeah, um, so so much, just so much um, symbolism in my path, and so mm -hmm. again, I knew that I, I had been depleted, right, fighting to make it to the end. Um, I knew I wanted to take a break before law school. I knew that I was I was serious about being an entrepreneur, but it was like, but, but what am I gonna do? Like, what is the business? Right. And so I um, I hadn't I hadn't listened to the episode. I had just crossed cross paths with my friend Elijah, um, and he put me on to the podcast, and mm -hmm. so um. I just say that to say I didn't have, when I left my paid internship and turned down a full-time job offer, I was already pressed to monetize. Gotcha. And so I share that to say with the audience, um, just to kind of reiterate the things that you teach us on a regular basis. So for me, my first step was, oh, I got to do something. Like, what is it going to be? It's, it's going to be scholarship coaching, but how do I put this out there? And so I did a scholarship event, uh, Scholarship Fest, which okay. is... Uh, it was, was essentially a scholarship panel with diverse voices of mm -hmm. different students, alum, administrators, just to talk about the impact that scholarship has on people's lives. Um, and so we did the Q&A and, and, and really what my goal was, I wanted people to get their questions answers. The right. name of our uh, discussion was Miss Mindset and Money. So I wanted to have raw conversation and I wanted people to feel comfortable raising their hands and asking questions and not feeling like, oh, this is a stupid question or, oh, I should know this. You'd be surprised how much ignorance exists 
um, exactly. just in this space. Like, for example, people think that if you don't earn scholarships in your senior year of high school, you kind of just asked out. That's right. not the truth. Because as I said, when I went to Howard, I didn't come in on a scholarship. So right. I, scholarships was my hustle. It's how mm -hmm. I lived, ate, slept, everything. Right. So I said to say, I did the, the scholarship event. And that was that was kind of my my first way of just just getting started, like launching kickstarting. Um, in the meantime, I was developing my business model. Like what will be my core revenue streams? Like how will this business sustain? Because I already had proof of concept and I right. had validation because again, people had already been coming to me for years. Again, I had been in the scholarship game since I was maybe 16 or 17 nonstop. Right. So I had, I've gotten people paid internships. I've gotten people scholarships to go across the world. Like I've, I have a track record testimony. So I knew the demand was there. Right. I just didn't know how do I package this and how do I put it out there? So I started again with scholarship fest and I'm proud of that event. Cause it is now scaled to um, what began as a, a scholarship panel at a library is now a full scale conference with breakout Ooh. sessions and keynote speakers. Um, and we have evolved the conversation from scholarships for me that's surface level surface right. level we can find you some scholarships we can get you in college like if you know how to look and where to find them but there's a deeper conversation that needs to be had how about what do we need to be doing to support our students from the gate to graduation outside of money outside of mm -hmm. finances so meaning what and on this panel it is more diverse perspective. So from the family end, from the community end, from the college end, because there are resources on college. So mm -hmm. for example, I have a parent on my panel where we get to talk about what does positive family support look like? Because what happens is many students go off to college first generation and it's like this, this conflict. It's almost like living in two different worlds and your family doesn't kind of understand because you're right. the first one to go that far. And believe it or not, students actually don't make it to the end because of they don't know how to deal with that. And right. then there's the mental health and emotional support. So I just say that to say that was my first sort of kickoff. Um, okay. And for me, it was a top of the funnel event because mm -hmm. after Scholarship Fest, they were like, all right, what's next? Like, we right. got the information. We got our question answer. Oh, you want to go sign up for coaching? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so I had already developed some different coaching packages to, up to sell, like, immediately at my event. Cool. That's and that's how I got up, many of my first buyers. Oh, see, now, what, I want the light bulb to go off to the BEB family. Um, this is some a young lady, dynamic young lady, as you can already see, that had an idea, had a concept, but she didn't just sit on that. And a lot of times we'll marinate on things and we'll try to wait until the perfect instance. It's never going to be a perfect time. And without putting something out, you're never going to get any feedback. So whatever you're looking to do or you're, you know, you're, you're running it around in your mind, Put it out there in some form or fashion so people can give you feedback. And that feedback is going to help you direct your course and where it's going to be profitable and where it's not going to be profitable. So, um, I mean, you're, I can tell right away you're a hustler. So <laughs> you're out there. No, you're getting it and you're putting things out in the universe. And that's how you continue to move forward. So I had a uh, mastermind group I was talking to the other night that I run. And uh, one, of the, one of the brothers on there. I, I'm telling him he has a lot of great ideas. I said, but bro, you got to put it out there so you can see what resonates or what doesn't resonate. So if you're thinking about something, guys, make sure that you take a step and put it out there. And as Amber said, I always talk about test, 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 test. There's always a 0.2 version, 3.0, 4.0. It doesn't have to be perfect when it comes out. Um, so now you were telling me you were pressed to make money. So how did you finance your business when, when it first started? Yeah, I bootstrapped my way to launch. Because <laughs> like, you got to keep in mind now, I have to make enough to provide for myself. And I mean, I'm just, I'm young, I'm single. I don't have many, you know, my living expenses. I keep them moderate, but I have to right. provide for myself. I have to have money to run the business and then right. I have to make enough to put money back into the business. So right. literally bootstrapping my way up. Um, really, I didn't have a lot of a lot of startup costs. It was just the, the general um, like marketing, web web development, um, just making sure I presented my business um, in a way that was true to like the value of the service I'm offering. Because I'm right. a coach and I'm offering a premium service at a premium price. Right. Nobody's right. gonna pay that if you're looking raggedy online and you're not consistent in that sort of thing. So I did understand, you know, the polished and professional look thing. But like okay. domain name and getting my documents set up with the county and, and things like that. So I didn't have a lot of expenses up front. Okay. 
but again, it was a new expense, you know, out and, and needing to make enough to put money back into the business. So I also, um, I saved. So okay. again, I, I had graduated last year, this 2018 in May. And um, in August, I uh, put my resignation in with my paid internship. They were going to offer me a job offer. And it was, it was hard. Right, like right. most people my age, normal people, a rational mind would just go to law school, <laughs> Amber, would just go right. get the job. Like you're yep. young, you know, but honestly, Jay, I, I heard from God and I, I just, I, I no longer subscribe to these beliefs that, that the, these norms, like, you know, you just hate your job for eight hours a day and then you can have the rest of your life. And then it's exactly. like, I just, and, and then trading my time for money, it wasn't fulfilling. Like I literally felt like I was dying at my desk. I'm shrinking. And I know I was made for so much more. And it's like, I had a risk appetite. Like I'm the time I was 23 years old. And so um, I, I just go back at that to say in that season, I remember having a graduation party. I was already mm -hmm. thinking about these things. I didn't tell anybody. I saved right. money from my graduation party. Like mm -hmm. I hustled, I bootstrapped my way. At one point, I humbled myself and went and drove Uber, delivered right. some pizzas. Um, one thing I had to learn was in this in this game of purpose, this life of purpose, if you are seriously purpose driven, pride has no place in a life consumed with purpose. And that's exactly. I, I really had to to hold on to that because it wasn't looking like what I thought it should. And I had to pivot. I mean, even right. after scholarship fest, I had buyers at my, like at my hand, like my target mm -hmm. buyers. Right. And they were parents. That's only one of my customer segments. I have multiple, right. I have three customer segments. Mm -hmm. uh, believe it or not, the parents at first were fickle. They weren't trying really? to pay me. They wanted to yeah, pick I mean, my brain for free. And they wanted me to sit. They didn't own right. They, Cause they weren't used to, I, I don't know what have you, but I had to make money because I was pressed. So right. I, again, um, I pivoted. I went to colleges and universities, right? Mm -hmm. Who already have budgets to pay me. So now they're calling me and hiring me to come in. But what I realized was, I said the parents were fickle, it was playfully. <laughs> but what I, what I mean is, what I realized is that segment, that right. customer right. segment requires more nurturing because exactly. they need to understand the value of their investment. They like what I'm doing, but to get them to pull out their checkbook, got to right. do a little bit more nurturing, right? And so these are just things I learned, pivoting, um, swallowing my pride, like, but just being, <laughs> oh man, I still do that. <laughs> like, yeah. If nah. you don't die to flesh every day, I don't know if you're growing and moving. That's it. Now, you, you touched on something that was very important. Um, and it's funny because my oldest daughter right now, she's um, just graduated. She's a year out and mm -hmm. she's talking about dad. I don't know if I want to stay in corporate or do my own thing, but I think what she's going to do uh, in her industry, she's trying to get some more hard skills before she steps out on her own. I said, Hey, leverage, mm -hmm. leverage wherever you are or wherever you're going to be. And when you're ready, you're ready. Yes. Um, so when you did your, uh, your scholarship fest, how did you get the people there and how did you finance that? Did you, was it at, where'd you say it was at a library or? It was at a library. library. Okay. So you didn't really have to pay too much for that, for that? No, it wasn't expensive. I think my cost there was about, what was it? Two fifty. It wasn't okay. expensive at all. No. Yeah. Now how about bringing in the people? How did you manage to do that? Yeah. So I, I went and did like what I would call an integrated marketing approach. So a combination okay. of um, traditional and then um, more, I guess, modern approaches. So I did direct marketing. Like I literally made a list. Who Who is the ideal person that needs to be in this room? So basically I went by way of my professional network. I gotcha. live in a small town, um, not too big of a region. Um, people know my name. I've established um, a presence um, and a name for myself and people already see me as an authority in my space. Okay. And so it was literally a, a, a matter of, of leveraging um, my resources. So I didn't necessarily have startup capital, but I did have contacts and right. community. And so I leveraged that. I did email marketing that helped me start building my list. Um, mm -hmm. I did social media, mainly LinkedIn and Facebook. Facebook is okay. a who you know network. It has the share feature. Make one good viral post and, and you know, <laughs> you're solid. Um, I did traditional media. I did flyers. I rode around in my car and went to mm -hmm. every block and made sure everybody, every hair salon, every barbershop knew about scholarship fest. I did radio interviews. I really just leaned on my resources because I right. was a lean business. I was, and I, and, and I needed to maintain or save whatever money I could to put into the event and get ready to coach afterwards. Which, right. So I, I want another light bulb to go off to the BEB family. Um, once again, a lot of times we don't have the money, but you have resources, sweat equity, you know, putting the work in. And if you're not, if you're not willing to do that, if, you know, if you just sat back and said, oh man, I don't have the money to get this event together, it would have never started and your business wouldn't be where it is now. So, 
you know, there's no excuses, family. Whatever, we all have some type of sweat equity available in us to get out there and hustle to make things happen. So when you're looking for the perfect opportunity, it's not going to be there. You have to create that opportunity. So uh, I commend you with, with, man, I'm telling you, powerful. I, I just love the story. When I see young brothers and sisters out there doing what they're supposed to be doing, following their assignment, uh, man, that, that just fills my heart up, man. Uh, <laughs> now, let me ask you, Amber, you had mentioned, you said you have three segments that you market to. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about, and I guess that's your monetization. So yep. can you tell us your monetization in those different uh, three different segments? Yes. So I'll tell you the customer segment and the value proposition to that segment. Okay. So I'll start with parents. Parents are customer segment. The value that they see and what I offer is, hey, if I invest, say, $1,500 in hiring a scholarship coach, she's going to save me tens of thousands of dollars in college expenses because my kid is now going to go out and earn all these scholarships. And so specifically parents who make above an annual income of $60,000, because um, it's parents who are able to afford this Ford. service, but specifically who see the value in their in the investment. Like right. I already intended on paying a portion of my my child's education, but if I make this investment, not only will it save me money, but it will develop my child professionally. Because with my coaching program, it's an integrated coaching approach. So I use a curriculum, okay. and again, scholarships for me is the surface level, um, right. but it's it's more of it, it's more things. It's the students learn personal branding. They learn um, networking. I introduce them to that concept and I make it very realistic to them. So it okay. wouldn't necessarily be tell an 18 year old, you need to be at all these networking events. It's <laughs> right. no, understand that relationships run the world. Does your right. guidance counselor know you? You know them, but do they know you? So exactly. when the opportunity crosses their desk, whose name comes to mind? So, you know, it's, it's, it's very integrated and the parents sees value in that investment. So that's the first segment. The second is college colleges and university. Specifically, four-year private and, uh, colleges are my targets because they okay. have a challenge retaining students. They have a retention okay. issue. So the value proposition is hiring this outside scholarship coach or bringing her in in some way to, uh, to coach or facilitate programming for our students brings us one tuition revenue, but it allows us to retain our students. They have a challenge retaining students from economically disadvantaged backgrounds and they right. transfer after the first or second year because they can't afford, afford to be there. Right. Yeah. So I literally make the money, right? I bring you tuition revenue because your students are finding scholarships they're actually eligible for, right? right? Not going to these big search engines and getting overwhelmed and discouraged because it's like, is this one real? And they're right. really picking one student out of the whole world for that scholarship. <laughs> so um, uh, uh, colleges and universities are my second segment. My third segment are scholarship providers themselves. Oh, wow. Okay, cool. Particularly the, the, the smaller ones. So they're the ones who um, probably uh, award $10,000 or, or less, um, ten to $15,000 or less annually. Okay. The challenge they have is literally marketing their scholarship. Okay. Like getting students to apply for the scholarship. So they see the scholarship queen as a partner, um, as gotcha. another resources to help them connect with students who are actually eligible to apply for my scholarship. Oh. So what I love about what I do is I teach students how to build a scholarship network, how to get okay. to the point where scholarships find you. And so what that means is there are scholarships, everybody's not eligible for the same scholarships. Right. There are scholarships for military kids. There are scholarships for um, students who are in, who grew up in foster care. There are students only for African-American females. Finding those and being able to compete because you have a better chance at getting them. So the, the scholarship providers who offer those, they want to okay. connect directly to the audience. They don't need to market to everybody. Right. And so Makes sense. Not only am I a scholarship coach, I'm a marketer, right? I studied marketing <laughs> in college. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> this is what I do. My professional background is in marketing. And so again, mm. they are another segment. So um, typically what that looks like is um, bringing me in to facilitate an information session, but okay. really what we're doing is promoting their scholarship. Sure. Gotcha. See, now, did you have those three different segments when you started or was that something that was developed after you got into the business? Develop after I, I got in because I, I started learning. I didn't know what I didn't know. I thought that mm -hmm. parents, I mean, it makes most sense. 
where are the parents who can pay me? Um, but what I realized is they need a little bit more nurturing. Okay, but I'm still pressed to monetize and people do like what I do. So how do I make this work? And so then it became colleges and universities. But from there, what I realized, because I now I'm immersed in this ecosystem, I started right. learning more and I'm a problem solver by nature. I'm an entrepreneur. And mm -hmm. I, I started um, just listening, just honestly listening and, and stop assuming that I knew everything. I had to check some of my assumptions. And as I listened to my peers who work in the same space as me to play on the same playground, what right. educators and scholarship providers would tell me, I would apply that to what I was doing. So scholarship providers would tell me, listen, we went from getting 200 plus applications to maybe mm -hmm. 20 to 30. Wow. What is going on in today's age with today's youth? And right. so that's what I, I would hear these common themes, common themes. And I could say, oh, how could I, I could provide a value there. I already do this. I'm a marketer. And so uh, to answer your question, it just, it, it came by way as, if, as I got more and more involved in what I was doing. Right. And, and, and that's what I was kind of getting, uh, making a point or two before. So before you get in business, a lot of times you'll have these assumptions. But once you get in there and start mixing around, then you'll really find out what's going to happen. But the only way to do that is get into the business. So you're never going to know everything. You're always going to be in a constant learning situation. Um, now, so do you get the, for your third vertical, uh, the scholarship providers? So do, do they pay you to come or, or use, you know, to speak about their scholarships? Or how do you monetize that aspect or that vertical? So I haven't quite monetized that segment just yet. I've only worked with that part okay. of my business model. I'm still figuring out. So right now it has been, um, well, I have monetized them, but not in the way that I know I can. So gotcha. what, what I mean is they participate in Scholarship Fest, the conference, by being a okay. vendor. Gotcha. Right, because I give them access to their target audience, so they pay to participate in my conference. I give mm -hmm. them access to hundreds of students, right, who right. they who are actually eligible for their scholarships. Because it's one thing to go to college fairs and it's like we have a scholarship for young black males <laughs> between this and, and no black male is in the room. At the, right. right, so I have their right, I have their audience, and so um, at this point, that's what that looks like. Still figuring okay. out. Um, what is there more value that I could offer them? Is it more ways that we can work together and I'm able to monetize it? Okay. Now with uh, this, the first segment with the parents, now you touched on something, the $1,500 and it's parents that make over 65,000, you figured out what the avatar is. Now say a parent or parents come to you and they don't have $1,500. Are there other options like a DIY or something that you can give them to help them? And what would that be? Yes, I typically do consultations, um, phone ones, typically 15 minutes, and those okay. are free. And I let them know, and I, and I tell them, I, don't, I won't waste your time, so don't waste mine. And I tell I them to come with questions, you know, prepare. I give away a lot of free information. Right. I do And I make myself um, available and uh, able to be um, accessed. But I actually had to create boundaries because I was doing it so much that people weren't paying me. Like I was just giving, 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 giving. But to, right. so to answer your question, what I try to do is reach those, figure out where are those community of students concentrating? Because it's not just one parent who can't afford right. it. It's not just two parents. And what I try to do is figure out who can be my customer um, to, in, in, um, for that consumer. So typically okay. it's the school district who can afford to contract with me and, okay. and create programming for those students. So typically when parents approach me, honestly, I try to answer as much of their questions <coughs> and guide them and send them other resources. Because what right. I also realized is my parent was that parent. My parent right. probably was likely not able to afford to, you know, invest that kind of money for me in a coaching program. And I didn't have a scholarship coach. The scholarship right. queen did not have a scholarship <laughs> coach, right? Right. So you, it, the, I say that to say it can be done. You can do it yourself. And so I just try right. to just tell them realistically, because everybody's situation is different. Just try to advise them on where they are. It's not, it's coaching is not a blanket kind of a, um, kind of an offering. Like right. I try to listen and, and just really advise on where they are. And they find that to be really valuable and really appreciative and pay me back with referrals and testimonials and all up. that. Yeah. So let me ask you, because um, I get this a lot too, uh, and I try to be as accessible as possible, and I do a lot of things for free. Like I was in Detroit uh, a couple of weeks ago at a uh, talk, and I told her, I gave people my cell phone number. Hey, if you need to connect with me, whatever. It was a smaller group. I couldn't do that in front of, you know, 200 people, <laughs> whatever, but it was a smaller group, but it was a good group. And I said, hey, reach out to me. 
you know, I'm here for you. And so I try to be accessible, but how do you draw that line? So, cause there are people, like you said, that, you know, you want to help, but you just you figuratively and literally can't help everybody because you don't have that much time in the day. So how do you draw that line? Now that I, so specific, well, I'll start with your question. I draw the line. I, I, you know, to be honest, I typically have not had to draw the line as much. I'm trying to recall on an actual example, because mm -hmm. honestly, Jay, as many times as I give out my number and email, most people don't follow through. I hear you. And so I'm, I'm glad that I kind of do set those. I don't just say, yeah, I'll give you an hour of my time and we can talk. Cause I wait, I, I was wasting my time. And so, right. and I realized, okay, I'm glad you didn't. Cause you're probably not my ideal customer. <laughs> but right. um, what I do is now that I'm more active on social media, I try to be able to give out as much and make myself accessible that way. Gotcha. Um, People, t I typically, I typically don't have to, like, I, I typically, again, just try to answer like questions and try to direct people to different resources. Mm -hmm. And, um, that, that typically ends well. Like I typically okay. don't have to, at least not right now. <laughs> I <laughs> guess I should start thinking about in the case that I should start thinking forward about if and when that happens. Okay. Now that makes a lot of sense. Um, so what do you think is your most effective marketing technique? My most effective marketing technique is when people experience the scholarship queen in person okay. or hear my voice in some way. For whatever reason, that is, more, well, not for whatever, whatever reason. I know that, that, I know it's more powerful. I used to underestimate how powerful things that I say and the way I show up, my presence was. Mm -hmm. um, for me, that's the most powerful marketing technique because my story is a message that, that resonates with somebody else. And until I have the courage to tell the story, no one thinks that their story is worth sharing or they could overcome and those sort of things so for me when it's when i get to interview on podcasts when i get to speak uh, mm -hmm. when i get to do things like that it, it's like i i get refer like man the business is great it's like right. i don't have to figure out who's gonna be my my social media manager and who's gonna <laughs> do this and who, but don't get me wrong again i'm a marketer so tr like integrated marketing approaches figuring mm -hmm. out how do i reach my ideal audience where are they hanging out how do i get in the room um I'll say one, people experiencing the scholarship queen, but also maintaining relationships. Six, so okay. um, I'm always at my business model canvas. I don't, I ha I rarely like spend a lot of time doing an actual like 30 page business plan. Right. Uh, when I need to, I'll work on those things. But <laughs> business is always changing. So I like the business model canvas. And there's, right. a, element, there's a category that talks about key activities. Relationship building is key for me. Like that is one of my big, biggest um, ways of marketing my business, um, mm -hmm. being able to have relationships with education influencers in Western New York, um, okay. in, in my region, being able to have relationships with superintendents. Like for me going to, I, I still go to networking events, but more strategically. Right. Like I don't go just to show face and, and hand on my car. Like I move with a lot more class now. Right. <laughs> like, so right. I just do. I do because um, I'm, I'm just very intentional. And, right. and I know that my, at this point, again, early on, my time is all I have. That's like I don't it. have yeah. a nine to five to fall back on. Like I have to be intentional with my time. So I use mm -hmm. a, a number of different um, marketing channels. I'm, I'm more active on social media now. I remember people would say, why haven't I found Scholarship Queen online? Right. And I would feel terrible because it's, it's true. But when you understand that, I was pressed to monetize, right? right. And I, I understand how my cash flows to me. I wasn't making money online. Right. I was not gotcha. making money online. When I, when I look back on data and say, how did my customer find me? The people who paid me, it, they didn't find me online. It's okay. nice that they could find me online, but they heard it from their colleague. They saw me speaking here. So right. um, a number of different marketing channels, but experiencing Scholarship Queen and building relationships, networking. All right, that's what's up. Now, we all know, Amber, that, that business doesn't always go straight to the top. Can you share a time with us <laughs> where you had some, some issues or some setbacks in your business, what that specifically was and how you overcame it, or if you didn't overcome it and what happened with that? So you can share, yeah. uh, you can share a little bit with that with us. There was a time where my largest client could have put me out of business for paying me two months late. 
Wow. So when you dive in, they always say entrepreneurship is jumping off a cliff and building your, your balloon on the way down. Yeah. Literally, you're going right. to get this right from the bruises. <laughs> so there were just things that I underestimated, things I didn't even think about. Having money on reserves, a small principle like that. Mm -hmm. um, so the, so the challenge was literally I was paid two months late, a significant amount of money that right. could have wiped me completely out. Now, cause I'm scholarship queen. I could have found my way back. Cause again, right. <laughs> I had traction, but exactly. it was like, again, I don't have a, a, like a nine to five or this or that. Like I'm all in at this point, everything. I'm an early stage business. And mm -hmm. so for me, um, it caused me to ask myself, why am I depending on one client to hold my business down? Why am I depending on this or that? And what I realized was at that, at that stage in my business, I don't have a business. I have a job. I am right. self-employed. I have not graduated to like, yes, I own the business, but I'm still in that quadrant of self-employment. Like this right. is my job. And so, um, that, that just caused me to start moving differently and, um, really, just making investments that could help me build out this business model so it could be much more sustainable. So okay. I enrolled myself in a small, what's called small business summer school. Mm -hmm. um, it was, so this summer, actually, I graduated from small business summer school oh, and cool. um, we would go there every week and we essentially walk through the business model canvas. But that was my way of saying this will never happen again. Cause mm -hmm. man, being put out of business and you don't have nine to five to go to, like, this is yeah. not a side hobby. This is not a hustle. This is what I do. Exactly. So that um, I, I, I'm grateful I was able to come. I did end up getting the check. But um, right. another thing that I learned was to understand the factors around my revenue stream. So for mm -hmm. that particular client, it was a community based. Um, so they were a community partner. They paid me to come in and do programming for their, their, their audience. Right. But their funding source is a grant. Gotcha. Right. And, the, and I don't know if anybody's familiar with how grants work in the grant world, but you get them when you get them. State funding, right. government funding, you, you get them when you get them. So I don't right. get to send them a late fee and say, because you paid late, you know, right. you owe <laughs> right. me this amount of money. No, I'm just asked out. So, right. but just understanding that now, if I'm going to continue to do business with this, 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 this character of clients that I need to know that upfront. So I'm not all like, you know, mad and out of business and going crazy. Like, it's like, no, exactly. it comes to the territory. So just things I had to learn. I'm grateful that I was able to overcome that because I had other streams of revenue, right. other kinds of clients, but that was my largest client. Yeah. I could have been whew, back, yeah. in, back at my desk, but <laughs> right. and not the one in my, and not the one in my home, but like the desk <laughs> that I left last summer. <laughs> yeah. Back at working for corporate America. And, and, and it's funny because we always say one is the worst number in business. So if you got one income stream or one big client and you lose that, your, your, your ass out, excuse the French. But um, so Amber, you got to have a tremendous story. Let me ask you, what motivates you to get up and do what you do every day? What What's that spark? Is that your assignment? Do you feel this is your assignment or part of it? I do. I, 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 I truly feel compelled. I think this is my current assignment. Now, keep in mind, when I was younger, I never said, when I grew up, I want to be a scholarship coach. When I grew up, I want to be the scholarship queen. I'm right. a problem solver by nature. And I saw a problem and I really believed in the value that I had to offer. But to, mm -hmm. so to your question, what motivates me? It's a combination between pain and passion, okay. right? I'm very passionate about, again, self-enrichment and education and black excellence and all these things I'm passionate about. But I think pain, the things that really set our hearts on fire cause us to move too. So right. the example I give, um, outside of scholarship coaching, I lead a fabulous tribe, an organization called Charm School for Sisters, oh, where cool. we teach African-American girls self-love, sisterhood, and success skills. And so how did I start Charm School? And I, had, I started writing the curriculum my freshman year at uh, Howard, and um, I had already started doing it. So that was kind of another means of making money outside of scholarship right. coaching for me. But what caused me to do that? Well, it sets my mind on fire. It, it makes my skin crawl to continue to, to know that Black women, Black girls are, are conditioned to believe that they are less than in this world, that they are right. ugly, that they are inferior, that, you know, messages from everywhere around the world, like it, it does something to me, like right. I have to move. So I just say that to say, like, it's a combination between pain and passion um, that motivates me. And I just know that I've always known that I was purpose. Like I remember right. daydreaming when I was a little girl 
like all the things I want for my life. And I didn't know the concept of manifesting, but essentially that's what I was doing, like envisioning and daydreaming and seeing myself and seeing things and, and, and literally thinking these things into existence. So that causes, that causes me to move. Just okay. knowing that I have a purpose, knowing that there's an audience waiting to hear my voice, that there's a little girl who needs to hear my story, that there's someone who needs to know that this mountain could be moved because Amber did it. Exactly. And when you get to that space, and, th and this is what I try to explain to a lot of people when we talk about pinpoint monetize your genius, when you're working within that genius space, there's, you can't even describe it because you're working with purpose, you're working with passion, you're doing something that fulfills you. I mean, I don't know how many people I talk to all the time that say, man, I can't stand my job. They're waking, they're counting the days down for the weekend. You know, oh, well, hump day is Wednesday. Man, all you got is Thursday. I got a, two more days left. And then Sunday night, which is heart attack night because people <laughs> are so stressed because they got to go back to work on Monday morning, you know, and that's just the, the cycle. And so I tell people there's a better way to do it. I said, if you're systematic about it, if you truly want it, just like you wanted to stay in school. You went to class for three months without being registered. That tells me that that's what you wanted to do. And so when I hear people, you know, making excuses. So we talked about like time vampires a little earlier about so people don't suck your time. So I'll tell people, look, here's my number. Uh, we decide on a time to, you know, connect. Call me at one o'clock. And I don't even, you know, take their number most of the time. You know, I'll be like, all right, this must be the person. You don't call me, guess what? I'm not calling you because I'm trying to impart information and education or whatever to you and level you up. Right. So yeah, you know what I mean? So do you really want it? And that's one of the biggest issues. People talk about it, but are you ready to boss up and do it? Mm -hmm. And so when you find young brothers and sisters like yourself, or Elijah Tyson, a lot of the other people I have on the show, I just, uh, I mean, my heart goes out because I see me and you guys years ago when people thought I was an idiot. Now, <laughs> entrepreneurship has been cool. But when I started, it was like, yo, you, you leaving Merrill Lynch to do what? You know, and I'm like, yeah, but that was something that I knew that was in me. And anytime you find yeah. as a person that you recognize and understand that there's something higher that's calling you mm -hmm. and you find that there's a better way to take care of yourself and your family, you can't fight that. And so when you look at people, you know, my age have been working in corporate America for 25 years and they can't stand their job. I'm like, I, I don't understand that. But, you know, it's not for me to understand everything, but yeah. there's ways to incorporate passion, talent, and monetization. And that's what that episode 199 is about. Um, let me ask you, Amber, you had mentioned something too. Um, we talked about time. How are you, because um, there's only 24 hours in a day. I know you're young and you probably can work 23, <laughs> but, but how are you monetizing uh, outside of the actual consulting and physical events? Do you have a passive, any passive monetization? Not for scholarship coaching yet. Okay. And that is where moving forward, that is where my mind is. Um, so specifically in the platform part of the pinpoint monetize your genius tool, like what is your platform well, right. um, or what is it? The platform is the other one between. The, so the bottom, the bottom right. quadrant, so, where we're talking about monetization. Right. Um, will it be books? Will it be a digital course? Will it be like, what will that be? So right. that, that's where my, my mind is now, because right now it is labor intensive. And gotcha. I do realize I cannot, I will not scale. Like this. <laughs> right. <laughs> I, right. I will not scale. So I am, November will make a full year. Um, and oh. it's, it's so, so talk about, I keep talking about symbols. November is National Scholarship Month. And that's oh, when wow. the scholarship queen, the business was born. It's amazing. And so, wow. um, but moving forward past this year, it's like, okay, I am not going to keep like tying my time to this because right. I left a job doing that. I could have stayed there. They were paying me more, honestly. Right. <laughs> I left a higher paying job to do this. Right. <laughs> like, right. I think not. And so, yeah, um, I am working on some things. Um, okay. so there, and there are a number of different ways to reach my audience. It's amazing. Just mm -hmm. repurposing and remonetizing a piece of value that I already create. And I exactly. love it because I get to, I can reach millions of students. That's powerful to me. Mm -hmm. millions of students across the globe with the help of digital products and um, just again different sorts of mediums of reaching them without necessarily me showing up 
somewhere. Physically, yeah, physically showing physically, up. Physically, yeah. yeah. So at this point, no, but that is where my mind is thinking forward to scale this business. Cool. And I, I want to uh, just note on that. So when you start a business, uh, let the light bulb go off, family. It's Amber is in transition. She's she's mm -hmm. starting out. You're figuring things out. You're doing a great job, but you recognize and understand that you can't keep running like this and scale your business. So now it's a, the thought process goes to how can I scale and how can I, you know, not trade hours for dollars. And that's all part of the process. So um, one of the th things that um, I always talk about, one of my episodes was called the uh, freedom equation. And that was uh, mm -hmm. cash flow plus passive income equals freedom. And that's eventually where you want to go because at that point, you can focus your attention and do the things that you know you want to do and you don't have to necessarily worry about the monetization aspect so if you're a philanthropist or you want to do uh, you know outreach work or you want to you know do charity work if you have the cash flow and you have the passive income you that equals your freedom so you're you're free to do anything that you want to do and uh, it's funny one of the things that really got me onto that years ago is uh our, my partner and I my business partner my ex-business partner we were in the mortgage business we were looking to buy a remax franchise and we had to meet man we i don't know why we were buying it in jersey but we're in philly but you go right over the bridge you're in camden and you, you know but uh this guy was a regional director of remax so it was about 95 degrees that day so we all suited up sweating like a like a pig and we go to this cat's office and he had um he actually ran over 30 offices in south jersey so partner and I all suited up. He comes in with flip-flops, a tank top, and like, I think he must've been going to the beach because he also had a like swimming trucks on. He says, hey guys, how you doing? Bop, bop, bop. And uh, so we started talking and he was like, yeah, I own about 25 Remax franchises. He said, I'm a licensed realtor and a broker, but I, I really don't do anything uh, <laughs> except my managers run all my offices. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was like, I'm free to pretty much do whatever I want. So you know, that's why he could come in like that. But being able to have that freedom to be able to do what you want. And um, you don't have kids yet, but when you have kids, it's, that's really important. And that was the, the biggest thing about um, what really I enjoyed about entrepreneurship. I was able to build something that allowed me the flexibility and freedom to spend time with, you know, with my family and my kids when they playing field hockey and all of that stuff. And uh, so that's a blessing. So that's my exactly thought- exactly what it is. Yeah, I was, gonna say, I was listening last night to the recent episode where we looked through um, Masterpiece, yeah. um, that episode, and it's something exactly what you just said, you reiterated in that episode, and it just reminded me, that's what entrepreneurship is for me. It mm -hmm. is an opportunity to create the world that I want to live in. It's an opportunity that's to it. create the lifestyle that I want. I've always been an architect of my own mind. Like I went to an engineering high school, but entrepreneurship is the means to actually do that. Like it's, exactly. how, you, it's how you do it. Exactly. So if you want, and that's why I tell people, if you have that freedom and flexibility, it's very hard to go back to, you know, God forbid, you know, you got to go back to corporate because you're used to running your own thing. And also it's a control factor. So mm -hmm. when we finish here today, I'm actually going to be doing a, a, a putting up a, a video, um, the Amber Geiger situation, the young lady that killed yes. the brother, right? In yes. Dallas. So I'm watching this video about the sister that made the video, not the actual okay. killing, but right after it. I forgot the young lady's name and how she lost her job um, because people were the, the, you know, lash people were lashing out at her because they thought she was like a pro-black activist and a anti-police or whatever. She ended up losing her job. Um, she had a side business and she had a, a Facebook page and an Instagram page. I think she was selling t-shirts. Okay. They got shut down because, you know, terms of service, um, her accreditation uh, in her business, I forgot what, what she was in pharmaceutical sales, that got revoked. So now, because she didn't control her revenue streams and income, wow. it got shut down. She was on Facebook and Instagram. I always talk about that's somebody else's platform. They can shut you down when they want to shut you down. Okay. Um, her, her main income came from her job that got shut down, not because she did anything wrong, but because she decided to speak out, you know, against what she saw and that got shut down. So when you lack control, that's when you become beholden to others. So entrepreneurship not only can create the freedom, it can create the control 
that mm -hmm. you're not going to be beholden to anybody else and you can live based on your terms and be able to have the values regardless of what they may be and nobody can take that away from you. So yeah. that's why well, a lot of times I tell they, people ask me about some of my brands that I sell online. I really don't tell a lot of people because if they know they can sabotage it. Oh, this dude is talking this black power, black entrepreneur stuff. Mm -hmm. 20 people over here and give them bad, uh, bad reviews. reviews. So, yeah. So in, like I said, so that way I have control over my income, which basically equates to control and freedom, you know, for myself and my family. So, uh, I didn't yeah. mean to go on a tangent, but that's what it's all about. Entrepreneurship, if it's, if it's done correctly, can be such a tool and an asset that you know you not just only affect yourself like what you're doing you're affecting the lives of, of students all over the country probably all over the world with what you're doing so i commend you for that because it's, it's not just about making money it's about a purpose you know your story using your story and your history from what you went through and taking that that bad time when you were in the in class for three months i don't know how you made the, the, the Jay, man, that is that <laughs> listen, stomach sitting in class, stomach growling. Listen, right, right, right. <laughs> but I, you know, I will never forget what it felt like to hear my academic advisor tell me, "You, you need to quit school until you can afford it." Like I will never. I mean, straight A, Amber. Like I will mm. never forget what that felt like. And so right. to be able to to move through that and to just focus on the mission of graduating and not all the mess around me. I never mm. want another student to feel what I felt like, exactly. like to be literally denied education. Patience. So yeah. I, for, again, it's just back to your point. It's a bigger, it's a purpose to it. I never want another student to feel like that. Yeah. Yeah. It's bigger than that. And so you're, you're helping other people, you know, let them progress up the ladder. And that's what it's all about. Cause people, I tell people there's a lot of stages in entrepreneurship. And one of the first stages is making money because you have to sustain yourself. I get that. But I said, after a while, when you figure out how to make this money and your money is stacking up, your mindset changes or it should change, hopefully. Now, okay, I got this figured out. Now, how can I be a blessing or how can I help others? First, you know, the first law is, you know, self-preservation. So you got to make sure you're eating because if you can't eat, you can't feed anybody else. But after you get to a certain point, now it's about, you know, how do I turn this around and how do I give back to others? And so you've actually started that process when you started your business, which is really a little bit uncommon because a lot of people don't think about other people. They think about this, let me eat first, but what you're doing, your mission, you know, is tied into helping other people. So uh, that, that's a blessing. And I'm telling you, I think it's a great opportunity that, like you said, the riches in the in the niches or niches, as they say, but it's a great opportunity, and what you're doing is a blessing to people um, that that need that. So, with your experience, Amber, um, where do you see yourself in your business in five years, if you can project that far down? Mm -hmm. Yeah, five years from now, gonna be running so for president. <laughs> you know what's crazy when I was younger people always told me that like I uh -oh. like you will be pre in the end I think at one point I so it was for first it was president of the United States then it was Supreme Court justice and they were all these things and mm -hmm. what I realized is I'll just be supreme at wherever God places me <laughs> that's what's like, up <laughs> I don't that's not the calling on my life not in this lifetime there you go um where do I see myself in my business in five years? So this is, I'm, I'm thinking, because this is something that I actually think a lot about and something I've had to do is be very open-minded, still be goal-oriented, right. but open-minded. And so where I see myself is still a, still building my brand, first of all, as the scholarship queen, still mm -hmm. developing um, myself and reaching more audiences and gaining um more authority in that space because I want to be able to establish bigger partnerships with right. bigger brands who support education. And I mean, consumer brands, right? Not right. just people who play in the education playground, but there's sports brands and all sorts of other brands mm -hmm. who want, who have, you know, scholarship um, objectives in their, in their mission. And so five years from now, I see myself stepping outside of the business. So not just having a job, but stepping right. outside of the business, like time wise and being able to move around the world. I see myself as um, a speaker and a coach with global impact. And so I'm being very vague 
but um, very specific. Like the specifics okay. are around the reach, reaching right. more people with this message and not just scholarship coaching, um, as the scholarship queen, but in another of other uh, other areas, I've I've been, I've had the opportunity to speak to so many different audiences. So whether it's you know youth empowerment or young women and and, and girls, but just continuing um, to develop myself. Because one thing I've I realized is I I, I feel like I was kind of like in a rush. Like, right. so, like I have way more tomorrows ahead of me than yesterday, right? right. And so sometimes I had to tell myself like to slow down and. Mm -hmm. um, really enjoy the process of stepping in like becoming i love how michelle obama taught teaches us about becoming but becoming is a journey exactly. right so exactly. um that that's where i see myself um cool. definitely stepping out scale this business stepping outside of it so right. not so so time and labor intensive but reaching students and, and communities across the globe okay that's what's up um do you have any employees now or are you you're doing everything pretty much on your own so I have um, team members who I will pay like for jobs, so stipends or gotcha. um, freelance projects, but I have no empo employees like full time other than myself. Gotcha. I can't afford employees at this point. <laughs> no, I understand. You out there <laughs> getting it takes Basically, time. there are a lot of resources though to access labor like these online platforms exactly. um whether it's um i actually stopped using fiber because there's the really? one that you put us on to yeah right. this one you put us on to yeah because yeah, if i'm be spending yeah. money i might as well spend money with my own people come on that and, and that's that's the reason i created hireblackfreelancers.com yes. is because i was looking for i'm like man i'm going over to bangladesh or whatever like getting stuff right. done and i'm like this doesn't even make sense now i may have to pay a little more for somebody in the states but that, that's okay because i i couldn't find certain freelancers and i started it because i couldn't find a, a videographer and i'm like man anybody know a good videographer so when i travel you know, I just found one when I was in Detroit. I have people come out, local videographers come out and, and record the stuff. So, um, but yeah, it was just crazy. I'm like, man, I'm, I, I got to stop spending money with, you know, people wherever they are when I can spend it with, with my own people. That's what, that's all I talk about, black economic empowerment. And yeah. if I'm over there talking right and doing left, you know what I mean? That doesn't, that doesn't stand up. So, um, yeah. Uh, so let me ask you, Amber, before we close on now, um, how can people get a hold of you? And if there are, do you have any events coming up or anything coming up? So just tell us, share all your contact information and any events and stuff that you have coming up. Yes. So you can find the Scholarship Queen online, um, Instagram at the Scholarship Queen and Facebook. We have a business Facebook page at the Scholarship Queen. Also, you can find Amber at Business Amber. So both of those at Business Amber and at the Scholarship Queen are my social handles. I'm also on LinkedIn. My first name is Amber. My last name is Quinny. So upcoming, so fourth quarter for Scholarship Queen. I'm okay. on I'm on a scholarship tour locally. Oh, cool. So okay. um, if you are in Western New York, whether that's Buffalo, surrounding areas, um, at Erie Community College, and these are this is all information you can find out online. But okay. Erie Community College, most of the SUNY schools, um, a couple private colleges. Um, again, all information you can find online. Madai College. I'm I'm talking off the top of my head, so no, no problem. <laughs> but <laughs> um, I know again, if you're in Western New York, Madai College, University at Buffalo, um, Erie Community College, North and South Campus, University at Buffalo. Um, find the scholarship queen will be on your queen. campus. I'd love to meet you. <laughs> I'd love to meet you. Um, but from there, I'll be I'll be wrapping up the year and just really getting ready to move forward into the into the new decade into 2020. And so um, my speaking engagements will likely end in mid November. I want to give myself time to recharge and refill. Right. I want to burn myself out and get, get ready it. to pilot in um, in 2020. All right. Now, for people that are outside of New York or the Northeast, Tell them what SUNY means, because they a lot of yes, people may not thank know. You. <laughs> <laughs> so this right, right. I'm talking to a global audience. And yeah, I'm exactly. Western New York jargon, right? So <laughs> SUNY stands for the State University at New York. So essentially, these are all the state colleges and state mm -hmm. universities in New in New York. What I will say is that while the Scholarship Queen is resides in Western New York, the Scholarship Queen it, it travels, right? So I, I had the opportunity to um to speak at a scholarship fundraiser down in DC twice this oh, cool. year. Really, again, 
with this business, I've literally moved by way of my network. And so mm-hmm. um, I've, I've, I grew up in Buffalo, but I lived in DC, went to school in DC. I went to school in California. I lived in Atlanta. Like I've used all of um, my resources, my contacts, and most of them were fellowships. I had nine different internships throughout college. Oh, wow. Like I continue to rely on those scholarship providers. They, the ones who gave me money love what I'm doing. They're now my partners. Hopefully my customers soon, but (laughs) they are now my partners. So I go back to them in all these different regions, mostly in the U.S. And so please don't think that the scholarship queen is siloed in Western New York. (laughs) Worldwide, right? (laughs) Worldwide, baby. (laughs) That's it, worldwide, baby. I'm telling you. Oh, man. So now, Amber, is there anything I forgot to ask you um, that you want to share with the BEB family? Anything that you forgot to add me, ask me. Or that you want to share? Yeah, let me say this. And as you are, wherever you are in your entrepreneurial journey, one of the biggest lessons that I had to learn was to not let my ego and emotions get in the way of being an entrepreneur. Business is business. Mm -hmm. Business is business. And a lot of times it's just purpose driven people. We get so caught up in um, just being people and you know we're human but business is business and so as i think back i I reflect a lot on what what did i learn um in my experiences one thing was just being able to manage my ego and my emotions and not to let those two things make decisions for me um i'll share this this is a personal testament real quick i'll I'll share this so I, in the middle of my first year, my fir- I call it my freshman year of full-time entrepreneurship, mm-hmm. I got an offer from um, uh, a competitor, essentially, oh, an wow. education foundation um, to come work for them. And they offered me six figures. And I told them no. I told them no. Now, in hindsight, this is where this lesson comes from. What I realized is I made a very emotional decision, right? Um, or I made, I decided out of emotion. Um, some of my thoughts were, and I did do an actual pros and cons and think through it, but right. some of my thoughts, which were very, um, I think just really naive, you know, they're trying to, they're, they're trying to um, buy me out. If they want to pay me a hundred grand, what are they really making off me? And, nah, nah, nah. and the reality is that is very valid, right? A conversation right. on worth, but I'm 24 years old. To me, making that from one stream of income, it ain't right, bad. Right, it doesn't right. have to be married to the organization forever, but you know, more strategically, being about my business. And so again, just the ego and emotion thing. And then lastly, um, one thing that I always love to share, I love to dispel this myth that growth is glamorous. Right. Please understand, <laughs> if you're not failing, you're not growing. If you're That's not it. failing, you're not growing. Um, growth is not glamorous and entrepreneurship is not sexy, but it is darn worth it. And I do know that. And that's why I continue to get up and do what I do. So um, just know that um, failing is the falling down. Like that's where, that's why we call it growing pains. And so something that I continue to tell myself is don't fear failing, fear not flying because you were scaled to fail. Exactly. That's it. Light bulb goes off BEB family. And that's what it is. It's the process. And failing and getting, you know, getting uh, stopped along the way, that's part of the process. So, but just recognize and understand that because we're no- normally taught, obviously, not to fail in everything that we do. But it, it's funny, a conversation um, I had with my wife years ago, because uh, I'm a serial entrepreneur, and she was like, dude, you sure you're good at this? And I'm, <laughs> and I'm like, nah, I'm getting better, right? <laughs> I said, but it's a process. I said, so... If multi-million dollar businesses can go out of business, why can't Jay Jones? All right, I don't have the resources. And I said, the, you know, these are companies with boards of directors, CEOs, millions of dollars, and they're going out of business. So I don't feel bad if something happens in one of my businesses because I understand it's the process. Mm-hmm. And so I, I used to, you know, always tell, and I still tell my girls this, I said, you have to embrace the process. So in order to be great in anything you do, even though if, if you're a, a boxer, you don't like running, you don't like all the training, but you need to be able to embrace that process because you take care of the process. What's going to happen is what's supposed to happen. So if you can't embrace that process and make fun out of the process, then you're not going to be successful. And it's all about right here. And Do you really want it? Nobody's going to give it to you. All right, Amber, you, you, you're a BEB family member, so I know you're probably prepared for this last question. I got it written down. <laughs> wait, wait, it's one of two. One of two. I'm yeah. not sure which one you're going right. for. I, I know you probably got them both written down, but. <laughs> <laughs> you right. know I do. That's it. So if you had the opportunity to talk to one person, living or dead, oh, who would that. it be and why? 
I thought it was the books question. Okay. Oh, no. <laughs> I was ready to vote. <laughs> okay. There you go. I like that preparation. Yeah. Um, <laughs> opportunity favors those who are prepared, family. Um, <laughs> What's up? Malcolm X. Malcolm X. And why Malcolm would that X. be? Yeah, Malcolm X is one of my heroes. Um, when I graduated on Malcolm X's birthday, after all I had fought through, I said, wow, God knew what God was doing. That's it. Wow. But um, one thing, so in his letter from the Mecca, when he mm-hmm. went and, and visited the Mecca, I've always wondered, because if, if it, for anybody who's ever read through the letter, mm-hmm. Malcolm X had a change of heart. Um, he just had experiences, um, spiritual different experiences, engaging with people who look like all just, I mean, white, black, blue, whatever. He mm-hmm. had a change of mindset. And so I always wonder how our world would have been different if he lived a little longer. I'd love to speak with him about how would you, how would you fight for your people different? How did, I mean, in what ways did that really change you? Not just shift your spiritual your right. spiritual outlook, but how would you, how would you seek liberation differently? How would you, because he even saw white people different. Like he exactly. saw, it, it changed him. And I don't know, I don't, I don't, I don't, he didn't, I don't know that he lived long enough for us to really feel the impact of that. So I love to have a conversation with Malcolm X. I sometimes think I am when I'm reading his books. I know. I know <laughs> and and, I, and I, I feel his, his impact and his influence and his presence throughout this world. Definitely. Yep, that you're actually the first person that said Malcolm X. That's a great answer. That's a great answer. Great man, great cause. He knew what his assignment was. And, and it's funny, guys, sometimes your assignment, um, you may not necessarily think you're prepared for your assignment. So you look at Moses in the Bible, he was like, Me, God, why how am I gonna free these people? But that was his assignment. So your assignment may not be something that you particularly are fond of, but you know that that's what you're supposed to be doing. So I'll give you a, a, like a perfect example. Like me, now on the show, I'm a little different than I am in person, right? Because I'm, I'm, a, I'm a jokester, right? Uh, like my kids are like, oh, dad, just silly. So I'm a, I'm, I'm a clown, right? And so on the show, obviously, I can't be that. I'll say a couple of things. I'm a little quirky, but I really don't like to be out front. I like to be behind the scenes. So I like to be the guy that's the operations guy that's doing stuff. So this is something my assignment, you know, black economic empowerment, it, it, it makes me now have to be out in the front, which I really don't care to be, to be quite honest in terms of, you know, just, you know, know the ride. It's funny. I got somebody stopped me at the mall the other day, like, yo, Jay, I'm like, oh damn, I must be doing something. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, but that's really not me. I'm, I'm more behind the scenes and trying to get, get the real work done but I, I understand my assignment because I'm so passionate about black economic empowerment and my people. I know that in order to, to, to lead this movement, then I have to be out there. So that's part of my assignment, even though I don't particularly care for, you know, being man, my face out there and stuff like that. But I know that's what I need to do to get this thing done. So uh, whatever your assignment is out there, family, make sure that, you know, you don't have to love it all the time, but make sure there's a reason that, that God or whoever your God force may be, put that in you, you know, be it Allah, be it Buddha, be it, you know, Jesus, whoever, or whatever. If you believe in a higher power, then, you know, there's a reason that that's within you. And so our job really, and I think the greatest, and I say this all the time, the highest form of entrepreneurship is, is actually pinpointing monetizing your genius because what you're doing is you're taking what's from within and you're spreading it out and you've able, you've been able to monetize that. So that's really the highest form of entrepreneurship. A lot of people, they'll go and they'll do things because, oh, this sounds good. I can make money. Let me think about, oh, I'm going to start a coin operated laundry Mm -hmm. because that can make money. Do you really, are you passionate about that? Probably not, you know, (laughs) but, but you're looking at the money. So when you can combine that passion and talent, you know, like Amber has done and she's going to go on to do many, many big things. I can just, I can tell you that right now. Um, The hustle, the, the commitment, uh, and one of the things I must say, your clarity for being so young and for understanding where you want to be and how to get there. I commend you on that because you've turned down, you know, how many, tw- you're 23, 24 right now. Yeah. Yes. You turn down six figure opportunities at that age for, for something greater. Not many. That's why right. so, at this point it's like, it has to work. Right. I just walked <laughs> away from a, it, it's, it's either going to work or it's going to work. 
Yeah. Like, but it's always going to work in my favor. That's what I believe. So I'll, I'll take the trials. I'll take, cause of that, those are my lessons. Like exactly. those, that's how I learn. Right. And that's what you build on. You yeah, build on build those on. lessons. Right. Yeah. And you always just think now, as you continue to grow your business, you always, people are always going to come at you to come back to go to corporate. So you can always do that. God forbid something happens because you'll have those hard skills. You, you're out there building your name, you're building your reputation. And a lot of times that's what companies look for. And you have the talent and the skill set to be successful in corporate America. You just decided to go on your own and do your own thing. And so it's almost like being a trailblazer. And sometimes it's scary. You walk in a tightrope mm -hmm. with no net, yep. you know, and you just have to be able to understand that. And I always used to tell my wife, you, you have to get comfortable being uncomfortable. And, <laughs> and if you can't do that, then you're probably not built to be an entrepreneur. You know, and what I hate to see, Amber, is I hate to see people with so much inside of them and so much talent mm -hmm. and, and so much, you know, blessings that they could give others by just sharing their story and doing what they're supposed to do. Like if you kept that blessing, uh, your story, which is, is actually a blessing, you didn't know it at the time when you were going through, <laughs> right, when you were going through those challenges at Howard without having the money and being registered, if you kept that to yourself, you're not helping anybody but you shared that and you're transparent with that. And now you're taking those experiences and you're helping others and not just telling them, you're actually showing them, Hey, this is how I did it. And so, you know, I commend you on that. I'm looking for great things from you. So whenever you take your next step or you want to come back on the BEB show, look, you got my number. All right. <laughs> anything I, I can do for day. you. Yeah. Anything I can do for you, you know, I'm here for you. So uh, BEB family, you know how we do it. Anybody that's on the show, they're on here for a reason because they've been vetted. They've been doing positive things. So anybody that needs a scholarship, you got the scholarship queen right here live and in living color. So reach out to her. And what's your, what's your email? I mean, your website again. Yep. Legendary scholars, academy.com legendary scholars, academy.com. I tell people what I do is teach students how to tell their legendary stories because we all have a story in a meaningful and compelling way such that somebody wants to cut them a check to go to school. That's what I'm talking about. I should have met you a little earlier, man. I got my, my, my youngest is in her third year. So look, we got to hey, talk. <laughs> well, huh? Cause I'm over here. I'm like, man, I'm writing these checks. I'm like, Oh my goodness. And the crazy thing is, you know, like with a private school and you haven't kind of mentioned private school. So like my oldest daughter went to Duke, which is a private university mm -hmm. and I'm paying more for university of Virginia, which is a, a public school. Then I did for Duke, which is a private school. Same case, similar case for me. So I went to two expensive private schools. Jay, my my one my first degree cost me a hundred and fifty seven thousand dollars. Man, first Man. degree. Now, granted, I didn't pay. Uh, right. I didn't. That wasn't my bill because I'm scholarship queen. Right. But I said to say I went to two expensive private schools. I went out of state. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, tuition was twenty two k at the time. I came back in state. You would think in state would be cheaper. In state was thirty six. It cost what? me thirty six thousand dollars to sit my tail in the seat. That's not books. That's not room and board. Mm. That's not food. That's not transportation. So this is why when I coach students, I coach them on how to be a student also because right. you're not gonna pay thirty six thousand dollars and think you're not showing up to class. I don't know how. Nah, I don't know where not. people parents writing them checks and doing all this other stuff and they're not even showing up to class. Nah, well, that's not an investment. That's an investment you're making. So yeah, it's it's, it's expensive. No it's no joke. I was like, man, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm sitting and I'm going through the paperwork. I'm like, all right, now I said, I'm paying this much for, for this school. And I'm like, damn. And yeah. Uh, yeah, well, you know, Duke is like, it's funny. They like with their endowment. Oh yeah. You, you want some more money? And I'm crying, poor mouth, all of that stuff. Look here. Mm -hmm. Can y'all give us some more? Oh yeah. We'll give you another 10,000. Oh, that'll work. You tried at a university of Virginia. They were like, man, you better get out of here. You can't pay, man. Go on, go somewhere else, you know. So, but uh, yeah, so I'm dealing with that right now. Um, and it's it's a big check, man. It's yeah. it's a big check. So anything, you know, like I said, I'm gonna be signing up after we log off. <laughs> <laughs> hey, there is money on the table. 
that was the that's how why I titled my last series of scholarship camps money on the table, table. because okay. I had to kind of really just start where people are I realized I'm so immersed in what I'm doing I realized people don't know these things because they're not they didn't live this right. I lived through it so but I'm able to teach them these things like outside of scholarship just ways of navigating college I just recently shared speaking I shared a story about how one time at Howard I remember writing an email to financial aid and I said hey my mom and I together have contributed I think at the time it was like five thousand dollars like this is how much we've come out of pocket we've done everything we can I mean you right. name it chicken dinners whatever we did everything exactly. like Mm -hmm. And so um, family helped and stuff. And so I asked financial aid. I just thought like, can you match me? I said, here's right. my transcript. Here's my track record. This is the kind of student I am. I'm fighting to be here. Can you help me? Do you know, Jay, that I remember I was in, I remember being in my communications class. I got an email that mm -hmm. said, thank you very much, Amber. We've seen that you've contributed X amount of dollars. We will match you. So you're That's holding removed and you can go register. But it's, it, man, I literally had to leave class because I'm just right. like, wow, it took me out. Like, right. but That's it's like, if I'm not willing to self-advocate advocate for myself um, mm -hmm. and, and fight for it, why do I think anybody else is going to do that? Exactly. That's a, great, that's a great point. They, yeah, that's they a great point. They created a scholarship for me. Yeah. That's what's up. Oh, uh, yeah. I'll be calling you. <laughs> so it's all kinds of, yeah, tips and trips like that. Because it's not Definitely. always a formal process. It's sometimes it's just speaking up. Right. Yeah, I look. How come I meet you like three years ago? You weren't well. You were doing it for yourself then. So <laughs> that's what's up. Well, Amber, we appreciate you taking time out your busy schedule. The scholarship queen. Y'all know how we do. Please support Amber and what she's doing because I'm telling you, it's such a blessing that we had uh, the uh, ability to get you on. And what you're doing is is I mean, we need that. Trust me. This is from from a father that's paying out the yin yang for these uh <laughs> for these college uh these college educations so uh i definitely feel that so thank you so much amber and we will be in touch and let us know when you come want to come back on again if you got anything new going on i will right. thank you cool. so much jay hey family that was an amazing interview with miss amber quinney the scholarship queen I uh, just want to give you guys a few takeaways, and at the end, I want to give you all of my social media contact information so you guys can connect with me and stay linked up to Black Entrepreneur Blueprint, the podcast, and the blog. Uh, first and foremost, uh, the number one takeaway I got was tenacity. Uh, Amber showed tenacity when she was in college, and she wasn't even enrolled in her classes, but she still went for three months straight. She said she wouldn't be denied. So she knew she had an objective and a goal and she continued to press forward. Didn't matter what it looked like on the outside. She knew that she had to be successful and had to complete that. So that tenacity. Now that tenacity also took over when she started a business. Now remember when she started, she didn't have a lot of resources. So when she started her scholarship fest, which was the event that really set off her business, she used the resources that she had, her connections and hustle to start that event and have a successful event and that led to her her success in her business so a lot of times we don't have the money that we need but we do have the resources and sweat equity that we can put in that's going to make your business successful so you got to have tenacity when you start a business uh, also another thing that I wanted to highlight when Amber started her business and not just Amber but a lot of people when you start your business Sometimes your assumptions aren't necessarily correct. And so what she did was she had to learn on the fly. And that's what happens in business. Because when we can assume something, that may not come to pass. But the only way, family, that you're going to know what you need to do to make your business successful is you got to put something out there. So there's a thing that, that's real. It's called <laughs> paralysis by analysis. So some people can do a 300 page business plan and they're still looking around talking about, oh, I got to do this, that and the other thing. And all that is, is procrastination and actually is probably a sign of being unsure. But that's natural for a beginning entrepreneur. So the only way to know something and get feedback, guys, is to put something out there. Now, I'm not saying spend all your money and put it out there, but put something out there, blog posts, uh, videos, whatever, get some feedback so you're going to let your, your audience direct you on where you need to go or where they want you to go. So don't have paralysis by analysis, family. The only way this business is going to take off is by doing something. OK, putting it out there. And remember, there are different iterations. So you don't have to be perfect when you come out. So there can be a 2.0, 3.0, 4.0 iteration to your business. 
So just put something out there. Take that first step. Um, something else that, that really kind of hit me was um, she talked about value propositions. And so a lot of times we undervalue our products and or services. And so what Amber found out was on her $1,500 product, she realized that not everybody could afford that. So she focused on a certain faction or an avatar that could afford that $1,500. So never keep dropping your price, okay? Because you're never going to please anybody. Whatever your value is, if you have a value proposition, then make sure that you stand by that and you make sure that you identify and highlight that. And so one of the things I always talk about, guys, is problem, solution, results. OK, so Amber found the problem. People didn't have enough money to go to college. The solution was the Scholarship Queens courses and lectures. OK, the solution is, guess what? Now you're going to have that money. So even at the fifteen hundred dollar price point for that, that portion of her um, of her services, if a parent can get more than fifteen hundred dollars, in actual aid, is it worth it? Is that a value proposition? Most definitely. I'm going to spend $1,500, but I may get $10,000, $20,000 in aid. Yeah, I'll spend $1,500 all the time to get $10,000 or $20,000. So remember your value proposition. And she was very, she was on point with that. So in order to sell something, you have to have a value proposition. And the easiest way to figure that out is problem, solution, which is your product or service, and result. Um, also, before we close out, I'm about to give out my social media contact information. Also, all the links will be below the video. But if you are interested in pinpointing and monetizing your genius, the implementation course, the program, go to BEBgenius.com. BEB, like Black Entrepreneur Blueprint, BEBgenius.com. And when you start to enroll, you can use coupon code Genius, G E N I U S, to save $100. Now, Amber mentioned that she used the mind map just actually from the audio of episode number 199. So please check out episode 199. But if you want to be able to implement that, go to bebgenius.com and go and get the implementation program. Save 100 bucks using the code genius. Um, now, if you need to connect with me, anything long, just hit me on my email, which is jjones at blackentrepreneurblueprint.com, J-A-Y-J-O-N-E-S at blackentrepreneurblueprint.com, Facebook, Black Entrepreneur Blueprint, Twitter, jjones001, uh, Instagram, jjones for real. that's the number four, R-E-A-L, YouTube, you're watching this on YouTube, please subscribe and like this video, subscribe to the YouTube channel, I have additional content on YouTube that doesn't come out on the audio podcast, now the podcast can be found on all your major platforms, iTunes, TuneIn, Stitcher, iHeart, Spotify, Google Play, and any other of your major platforms. Um, if you want to uh, connect with me via LinkedIn, go to J. Jones, Black Entrepreneur Blueprint. Uh, if you want to be included in the BEB text line for notifications and uh, reminders, text BEB, like Black Entrepreneur Blueprint, to 555-888. BEB to 555-888. Also, if you want to book me for a university, college, organization, or church, <clears throat> Excuse me. You can go to bookjjones.com, fill out the short form. I'll get right back to you. Uh, my book tour is still going on, A New Black Wall Street, Circulating the Black Dollar Worldwide by Building Successful E-Commerce Businesses. Also, everything I just said, if you're in the car watching this or whatever or listening, you can go to bebconnect.com, bebconnect.com, and that'll have all of that contact information that I just gave you. Also, it will give you access to the latest uh, edition of the podcast. So that's BEB Connect. And I want to say this like I say each and every week on the audio version of the podcast and also on the video version. I want to thank the BEB family because each and every week we get more and more downloads. We're trying to get this good word out to the folk uh, once again. And I, I want to thank all the family members. Please spread the word about the podcast, the blog, the YouTube channel and all that good stuff. Because once again, if it wasn't for you guys, I wouldn't be here doing what I'm doing. Love you guys. I'll see you same time next week. Peace.